Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is Sunday. It's a day that a lot of people attend church, but you don't need to attend church today because you're going to hear a very inspirational story. My guest is Dr. Dawn Musalem, and she has an incredible story. It's almost unbelievable because she was a she is a stage four cancer survivor, a heart transplant survivor but now she is not just surviving, but thriving, running marathons. In fact, I think she's the only person that ran one within a year of receiving a heart transplant. And now she's just here to inspire and help other people. For her, every day is a gift. And if you know anybody that's down in the dumps for any reason, she is infectious. I mean, not, not literally. I mean, but <laughs> <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> You know what I mean? Her 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 enthusiasm, her zest for life is infectious. She personally. <laughs> it's very safe if you're around her. <laughs> Please welcome her to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Your story is, like you said right before, you have to write a book. And not even a book, like I, it could be a movie, really. Okay, I'll do it. And, and, and I think um, um, Margot Robbie could play you. Okay, that sounds good. Well, Chef AJ, thank you so much for having me. It It really is just such a privilege. You have no idea. I followed you for quite some time. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for inspiring so many people, including myself. And this is what our human experience should be about is inspiring others and, and sharing that gift with the world. And you have certainly embodied that and done that beautifully. Well, so thank you. I wish I had heard about you sooner. I heard about you from, from, um, Jessica Crock, who everybody knows now is having a baby. And so that's really, really exciting. And so I'm so glad to know you now. So where would you like to start? Because I mean, you, you also happen to be vegan and plant-based and that, and that, but, but the things that, that happened to you really were not because you were, or it wasn't really a dietary thing. It really wasn't, you know, and I've had so many people ask me how, how are you still smiling that? And, you know, I've reflected back and I think it came to when my mom was pregnant with me. I came from the most loving family. My mother describes being pregnant as like the most joyful day of her life. She loved being pregnant. And, you know, I think that matters. I, I you know, for pregnant women out there, it matters, your emotions, your consciousness, your, your feelings. And so as a young child, I was a very happy child. My family was very focused on whole food, plant-based nutrition we were not entirely vegan. We were more vegetarian based, but we would have occasional meat. This was, you know, back in the seventies, we had a, a butcher that was local in our very small community. So we, we were a very, um, a, a family who just used very small portions of meat if we had any of it, but come junior high is when I, I did become a vegetarian and vegan, you know, and pretty much all the way through. Um, it was kind of cute around the age of four or five. I remember watching the Today Show and I loved Willard Scott's 100th birthday celebration on that Smucker's jar. And so at a very young age, I set out to want to be 100 years old. So I really took the whole food plant-based nutrition and, and really cherished that as a young girl. I prided myself when I would go on a field trip to, to take a healthy algae bar, to take dried apples with me or healthy food compared to my friends eating the processed food. So this started, you know, very, very young. I was healthy my whole life. I, I never saw doctors um, oh, in undergraduates. You, go ahead. When did you want to become a doctor? You know, I knew that. So when I was young and people say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'd say, I want to be a hundred years old and I want to live to be a doctor. So I knew I wanted to do both. And I was very interested in more um, holistic healing, actually. My undergraduate study was exercise physiology and nutrition. So I wanted to study, you know, how to optimize health. And I went on after my undergraduate degree to do research at the Cooper Institute, where I actually studied centenarians and how they were able to flourish well into their 100s and still attain high levels of cardiovascular fitness. Um, and I uh, worked very deeply in the biomechanics area for um, muscle maintenance during that time as well. And then that was kind of my segue to naturopathic school. So I went to naturopathic school in Arizona before I went to traditional medical school. And I was a little concerned that naturopathic school would be a little limiting for me because I wasn't sure I was gonna wanna stay in those particular states that allowed for naturopathic physicians to practice medicine. This was back in 1998. And at that time, there were very few states that were allowing for naturopathy to have a license. 
So I transitioned to osteopathic school and there happened to be an osteopathic school right in the local area in Arizona where I was in naturopathic school. And that was a perfect fit for me. In fact, growing up, I only saw osteopathic physicians. And so I was very interested in more of that holistic scope of practice, the osteopathy, the cranial sacral therapy, all of that was very, very appealing to me. And it was during my first um, few weeks of medical school that I wasn't feeling good. And here's this young woman who had just really took really good care of herself, never sick, very physically fit. Um, you know, I would often run 10, 14 miles on the weekend. I would climb Camelback Mountain in Arizona once or twice a day, even. I just loved physical fitness. And if, as I was saying, a few weeks into medical school, wasn't feeling well, saw a doctor. He said, maybe it's asthma, gave me an inhaler, saw a second doctor because my symptoms weren't getting better. He said, use the inhaler more. So weeks went by and the symptoms got progressively worse to the point that I, I could no longer run. I could barely walk. I, I couldn't even walk a hundred feet without really having difficulty breathing. So your main symptom was, was shortness of breath? Shortness of breath. Otherwise felt totally fine. Hmm. And no one at either of those two exams had ever listened to me, which is so bizarre. You know, doctors know that you need to be thorough. You need to listen. But for whatever reason, they weren't listening to me. Saw a third doctor and he actually said it was in my head. He said, he said this is what happens to all third year medical students. It's psychosomatic. And you're probably studying this in your in your education right now. And I started to feel so guilty. Like, oh, my gosh, is it stress? You're not a whip. What's going on? <laughs> So it was a, a few days. I was going home from medical school after I saw that doctor and I collapsed. I was taken to the emergency room and I had a 16 centimeter mass in my chest. It was wrapped around my heart. It was compressing my major vessels. And they had to take me to urgent surgery because of, of the fact that I was in cardiovascular compromise and the blood could not get to the you know, vital organs the way it needed to. So they tried to take the tumor off of that, that chest area and they were fairly successful with it, but they had to start immediate chemotherapy. It was a non-Hodgkin's diffuse B-cell lymphoma, which is a very rapidly growing tumor. It's not one that you can really pause on. And so that's why over the short period of time, this tumor just kept on growing and growing and growing. And so they started chemo very quickly after that surgery. And you know, I remember when the doctor first told me that I needed to have chemo, this is on Thanksgiving weekend in the year 2000, is he wiped out all sense of hope. You know, he's like, this is stage four cancer. You're never going to be able to have a baby. You need to drop out of medical school. And it was just like this shake, you know, very hard to, to handle at first, but it kind of ignited this autonomous motivation to do what I knew I could do best. And that was live a healthy lifestyle during this time. And I ended up hiring a doctor that I knew I could trust, one that was supportive of me staying in medical school, one that was also supportive of me using holistic modalities of therapy along with the conventional treatment. So I used naturopathy right alongside my conventional chemotherapy. And I attained my vitality without pause. And in fact, I started feeling better because that tumor was shrinking very, very quickly. And within weeks, I was back to exercising at a high intensity. And I stayed in medical school during this entire time. That's incredible. You know, you bring up a point, and, and again, this may not be 100%, but I've noticed that the, I don't even like the word alternative, because I think all the stuff that, that Western medicine does should be the alternative. But the people that we think of the alternative medicine doctors, they're usually okay if you also do traditional, whereas the traditional doctors are always opposed to doing alternative. It seems that way anyway, at least the ones that I talk to. You're right. You know, and that's where I think we have to really focus in, in allopathic medicine that's traditional, you know, uh, Western medicine with integrative care, where we use the evidence-based therapies and modalities that we know are safe, number one, that can potentially complement what we're doing conventionally or help to dissipate some of the toxicity and help patients to attain their vitality. And that's actually my specialty at Mayo Clinic is integrative oncology and lifestyle medicine in the cancer center. And I, I love what I do because for me, it's what allowed me to attain vitality during all my chemotherapy. 
I ended up needing a bone marrow transplant because it was a stage four cancer. And if they did not give me uh, the bone marrow transplant, there was big concern that potentially this cancer would come right back and it would come back more aggressive and they would never be able to treat it. This was before they had the rituximab, which they have now for, for this sort of cancer. So, you know, I just had the cancer at a time when this is all we knew. We, we didn't know what we know today. Do you have any idea what might have caused it? And like, you didn't even notice it until you got the symptoms. And by then it was already stage four. Like, could you, how could you have found out earlier or could you have? Well, I think if that first doctor would have listened to me and done a chest x-ray, we would have found it early. You know, this was, this was a few months before that those symptoms had progressed. I had presented around August to this first doctor. And then I ended up getting diagnosed uh, Thanksgiving of 2020. So several months had passed. So had that first doctor listened to me, uh, you know, I, I, and taken my symptoms seriously, I think we would have caught this and it would have saved all of this downstream toxicity that I've had to encounter, you know, as a result of those very aggressive therapies that saved my life. You know, I would never trade in what I did. I would never, I never look back and think, man, I wish I didn't do chemo, wish I didn't do the transplant, wish I didn't do radiation because it saved my life, which otherwise I had a very high mortality rate, but it was miraculous. I, I mean, you know, I really felt energized during chemotherapy. It, it was such a beautiful experience. And it probably sounds crazy for some people to hear this, but my life was glorious for a 26 year old woman to say that who, you know, was originally told she had to drop out of medical school and wouldn't be able to have a baby in the future. For me, holding on to what my purpose in life was to one day be a doctor helped me to stay strong during this time. And it kept my mind off of it you know, and I exercised uh, all during chemotherapy. During my bone marrow transplant, they brought a bicycle into my room so I could ride a bicycle in my room during the day. They even had a bicycle outside my room that looked at the mountains in Arizona in the morning. I would set my alarm every day in the hospital during my bone marrow transplant, wake up at 4 a.m. I stayed on a regular schedule so that life felt the same to me. Um, I'd ride that bike every morning and watch the sunrise. And I remember looking out and seeing all the other patients. This was you know, you were like kind of the girl in the bubble, the boy in the bubble. You were in these very secluded, all glass rooms, but you could see the other patients. It was very interesting. And it was like a circular unit. And oh my gosh, everyone looked so sick. And I didn't feel like I looked sick. You know, when I look back now at some of those pictures, I looked awful, but I didn't feel sick. I felt like a million bucks, you know, and life was vibrant. The human experience was blissful and it gave me such deep meaning, purpose, and gratefulness for my existence. And so I went on after the bone marrow transplant and I had to have several weeks of radiation, about eight weeks of radiation therapy and continued on in medical school without pause, did terrific. The cancer was cured. It was a miracle. How were you able to keep up with medical school and the demands while, while going through all this treatment? That's what I'm saying. I was so energized. You know, I ate my healthy diet. I had some of these naturopathic therapies that working alongside of me with acupuncture. It, you know, I really see even in my own patients. And there was just a recent study that was a fabulous study that looked at the impact uh, during chemotherapy of individuals on a plant-based diet. And it showed that it helped reduce fatigue. And that's what I experienced. I had severe anemia, but uh, I, I never lost that energy. Did your, so I think, did your professors and classmates know what you were going through? Oh yeah. I mean, I, I had lost all my hair. So they were very supportive that my professors and my classmates would bring my test to me at the hospital so I could take my tests. Um, I would continue to study and it just gave me my purpose. What else was I going to do during this time? Sit and think about my illness. I didn't think about it once. I stayed very busy. Um, I would recommend that for everyone, you know, stay authentic to yourself. Don't let the disease define you. Let the disease elevate you. Use that as kind of lever to, to grow. And we know that there can be post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's very easy to fall down that path, but there can also be post-traumatic growth. And so I was just very blessed to be able to have that awareness and kind of that internal self-guide to take me towards that place of post-traumatic growth. And that's exactly what happened. You know, I have deep belief in God. I have strong faith. And I think that knowing that, hey, I can't change this. I so deeply believe in acceptance and 
peace. You know, my heart and my soul had peace, acceptance during this entire time. I had no turbulence. Perhaps because I didn't have a family or children, you know, it was only me. If I died, yes, my parents would have been very, very sad to have lost me, but it was just me. So I was okay with my mortality, even at a young age, and I still am today. Wow. But you weren't ever afraid? I mean, and and either of, of dying so young or even those procedures? I wasn't. I can't explain why. I think it, and I wish I could, and I'm processing all of this. I, and I shared with you earlier, I, I want to write a book someday, but so, so much of this, I do see that it was so different from what I see other patients that I work with experiencing at times, but I do cross paths with many patients that were just like me. It came to that acceptance. Just, I, I love to live in that place of harmony and not go against resistance. And it just felt like go with the path of that least resistance and ease and flow. And I did exactly that. And I trusted my doctors. Um, There was some pain. There certainly was suffering, but I feel that that is part of the human experience. And when that pain and suffering is gone, oh my goodness, it's like your life just elevates, you know, and the existence is just so sweet. Did you ever go back to the original doctors that, that dismissed you and say, Hey, by the way, I didn't No, I, you know, it, it was one of those things where everything was just so fast paced and it, they were kind of like urgent care centers. They really weren't my doctors. It was just going to these urgent care centers, trying to get help. I was a medical student, you know, so busy. I probably should have, you know, so they would have learned that, listen, you need to do this. Um, but I didn't, I had to stay in the positive, you know, I had to really focus on that and it wasn't um, toxic positivity. There was no turbulence. I've seen that, you know, I've seen that with some of my patients where in their struggle to try to attain that positivity, they almost get turbulent. They're, they're like almost obsessed with it. And it wasn't that I wasn't worried at times, but I just, gave up that worry to just trust God. I think that's what it comes down to. I think it comes down to my deep belief in God. And, you know, I was raised Roman Catholic, but it's not that I'm necessarily overly religious. I just have deep belief in God. And I trust that, uh, that life is about something far bigger than me. And I just trust the process. You know, I'm so interested in this topic right now for a variety of reasons. So all the books that I've been reading are basically about faith. And like, I, you're probably familiar with the work of Dr. Kelly Turner, Radical Hope and Radical Remission. And then I've just read Cured by Dr. Jeffrey Redinger, MD, who's going to be on the show on Thursday. And it just seems that the, the, that those with deep faith just seem to do better when they have this type of situation, you know, or it, even if they do end up passing, they, 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 they suffer less than yeah. so. He wonders, you know, and I'm so devote to my whole food plant-based nutrition. So one would say, well, why don't you just eat anything that I'm like, cause I love my whole food plant-based nutrition. I feel that that's our responsibility to take good care of our body. But, you know, I feel that in some ways, maybe our existence is predetermined. Like we're, we come to earth and maybe some of this is just predetermined, but I was given a, a, a gift. You know, my soul, I think, was just given this awareness, this love, this gratefulness, this ease to be able to handle these multiple levels of adversity that I was given. And I'm just so grateful for that, for exactly that. I'm so grateful that I had deep passion and purpose for what was really important to me with staying in medical school as I was first diagnosed with cancer and that I had that deep belief in God. And then I had so much love. Oh my gosh. Like my friends, my professors, my doctors, and my family loved me so much. And so I felt in my childhood was like the picture perfect childhood. Everything went my way. And I see other people that struggle in life. And my God, if I died at the age of 26, my life was so perfect that it was okay. You know, I just, I was okay with that. So it was very interesting. And, you know, as, as my life was always so perfect, a miracle happened. So my husband and I in 2003, we got, I, we found out we were pregnant and I wasn't supposed to be able to have children. And so I, I was able to give birth to my daughter in May of 2023 and 2023 this May. May of 2003. Okay. Okay. I was going to say, Hey, you just had a baby three months ago. 
<laughs> oh my gosh, I've done that before. I can get my ears all mixed up. Thank goodness you listen. It gets so confusing with 2023, 2003. So 2003, I had my daughter, Sophia. And a few weeks after I had my daughter, Sophia, I started not to feel well. And oh my gosh, the symptoms were exactly like they were when I had cancer. And you know, now I have a baby and a husband. And now I was really scared. You know, the situation was different. Now I was a mom. And now my existence was really important for the life of another human being. And so I was very scared. And I kind of kept those symptoms in for a while without letting anyone know. And then one day I just couldn't, I felt like I was going to collapse, went to the emergency room and my heart was in advanced heart failure with an ejection fraction of 8%. Wow. And so, um, that was very scary. And, and I, we had to go to the closest emergency room because I was not stable. It was not Mayo clinic. And the doctors at that hospital had said, you're going to need to transplant urgently. And this was in again, two, 2003. And so that's when I went to Mayo Clinic. This is when I first became a patient at Mayo Clinic. Now I had done my training at Mayo Clinic for clinically, uh, clinical training in medical school uh, during this time. Um, but I became a patient at Mayo Clinic and they filled my heart with so much hope. They said, Dawn, we're gonna use medications. When the medications don't work, we'll have to do procedures. When the procedures don't work, that's when we'll have to consider a transplant, but you may never need a transplant. I mean, that's just, I mean, that's just, I, I, that blows my mind because do you know why you went into heart failure? Yeah. You know, we, we knew this risk was possible. The high dose chemotherapy I had was extremely high dose and the radiation because the tumor was actually wrapped around the heart, the radiation went right to the heart. And in fact, part of that pericardium was even involved with some of that cancer. So, so my heart was radiated, but I don't remember, like, honestly, like I was so busy, you know, in medical school that I don't know that I really listened to my doctors as much. And I didn't want that fear. Like I kind of just dismissed it. I was like, I need to just stay with life. And so, yes, very advanced heart failure from chemotherapy, radiation, and possibly postpartum. You know, most women are not able to have babies after all this treatment. And here I have a baby very quickly. You're, and that's You're like the miracle woman. You know that maybe that should be the name of your book because really it's, I mean, you know, it, you know, it wouldn't, anything that had happened to you would have been enough, but it's like things keep piling on and you're just, you were withstanding all these things and doing it with such grace and, and lack of fear. That's the thing. I mean, I get scared. If I had to get like a, a tooth pulled, I'm like freaking out. And you just seem to have this calm about everything that happens to you. But that's okay. You know, and, and, and I just, I love people so much when, when I sense that vulnerability, I just, I, I think that's actually beautiful. And sometimes I wonder if I'm like just too aloof to that. I'm not quite sure, but I think that's beautiful that you understand that level of vulnerability. And, and I think that's what makes each of us so unique. I love people. I mean, I just love people. I love that you said that. So the heart failure was really difficult. You know, we, um, what was, what, what, I mean, not, not that either was great. What was worse, the heart failure and the heart transplant or the having the cancer and all those treatments, or were they both, um, oh. Neither cancer was. was easy. Cancer was totally easy, you know, because I knew we could treat it. And, you know, it was so crazy. I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm happy I have cancer. Cause if this is asthma and if I had to live like this the rest of my life, I'd be miserable. So treat it, fix it. So I can get back to Dawn's life, you know, it, it, especially with exercise being so important to me. So now I have heart failure, which really is a chronic disease that isn't going to go away ever unless I get rid of this heart, you know? And so I was kind of on this, um, new trajectory of life. I had to accept, I couldn't fight it, but it was so sad. You know, I couldn't wash my baby. I couldn't hold her. I couldn't pick up groceries. I couldn't even pump gas. I mean, I couldn't do anything. Heart failure. I remember saying it was like my life was shackled. Uh, I had the fortune of having a, a phone call with Dr. Dean Ornish, uh, you know, ask, actually asking if some of my residents would be able to be able to shadow some of his uh, telehealth visits. And, um, he had asked me if I ever tried to do a plant-based diet to reverse some of my symptoms. And, you know, I, I did. And, and it's just, who, who, with all that, who was it that you were talking to? Dr. Dean Ornish. Dr. Dean Ornish. That's amazing. You know, he's done such beautiful research in this area and it's just, my heart was so scarred from that radiation that everything I tried to do wouldn't reverse that heart failure. I was really dependent on many medications and after a few years, they had to put a device in my chest that helped my heart work a little more efficiently. And 
it was very interesting that that device was very investigational, but it was very fascinating that they were able to put this device back in me. And this was around 2006. Um, it was called a biventricular pacemaker. But then in 2008, August of 2008, um, we had a, a very loving family and we had a lot of, even though I was in residency at the time, I was able to work back into medical school residency at Mayo Clinic, but it was very difficult in residency. And in 2008, there was one weekend that the whole family, we had a big family, we went out to dinner. And that particular night, my husband said, you know, honey, go sleep with the baby. And I didn't think a thing of it. You know, I was like, okay, that's fine. You go, I'll, I'll go with the baby, You get a good night's sleep. So the next morning I woke up, I was doing a little work at the computer. My daughter woke up, I fed her breakfast. And this is so unusual because our whole household were like wake up at 4 a.m. kind of people. And eight o'clock rolls around and my husband still wasn't up. And so I just thought, this is so weird. Maybe he was just that tired. Maybe he's sleeping in, but he had never done that in years prior. So I went into our bedroom and my husband had actually died in his sleep. God. And that, that is the worst. And, and you know what I learned is I would so much rather have, be a patient. I would so much rather have cancer, have heart failure than to be the spouse who goes through loss. And I felt so helpless because I, you know, I knew once I saw him that he had died many hours before. This wasn't something that had just happened and I couldn't do anything. And, you know, here I am, like, I'm just really just authentically happy, joyful, loving individual. And my existence is very high. And I describe it as everything just like free fell, like that, that roller coaster, that free fall. It's like my whole life and vitality just flattened. And I was just without any emotion. It was like I was alive, but there was nothing beyond that. I never went into a depression. I never got down, but I was flat. It's so hard to describe. Oh, how long but, have you been married? And how old was your child at the time? Sophia was five. She had just turned five. Um, do, do, you you think, know, do you think he knew? Because that for him to say, go sleep with the, like, do you, I think he was probably having symptoms then. And he didn't know he did, There was a strong family history of, you know, earlier um, heart disease and he probably just, just wasn't feeling well. He, and I don't think he realized, but you know, what I would say is that when you love someone so deeply, that loss is such a reflection on how special your relationship was. And it just really taught me that transformative power of, of grief or suffering, pain, whatever it is a person goes through, that it, it can help to move you beyond just coping with hardship. And I had to learn how to kind of transcend that and to move in this life of renewal. And again, it came to my faith. I actually had gone to listen to this nun who happened to come into town. Her name was Sister Grige McKenna. And she had done these miraculous healings and she's just this very spiritually centered woman. And I had read her story and I really wanted to listen to her speak. And this was many months after my husband had died. And so I went to listen to her and I remember just sitting in the church and just cried. And after hearing her is when I really felt like I had an understanding that I needed to, to get strong. I needed to get strong for my daughter, you know, and this is when I really kind of experienced this awakening and, and just inspiration to, to live again. And this is about nine months after he died. But that was the hardest thing that I went through. Even to this day, it's the hardest thing. Oh, um, so I just I mean, it's like so you've been given more than most people have, and you're not that old, and you've been given more challenges, I think, than most people face in the lifetime. And I was just thinking, because I love coming up with titles. If you write a book, I think the title <laughs> should be called Resilient. I love that, AJ. By Dr. Dawn Musela, because mm -hmm. I mean you are just a perfect example of life not life doesn't really knock you down, it tries, and you just come up even stronger. You know, it's like, I, I feel like the Helen Reddy song is like your theme song. Like Invincible could be the title of your book too. Oh, that gives me chills. I don't know. I mean, it's just, I guess what I wish is I, I wish that people could just experience my life one day. Like I wish they could just like pop in my body because it feels so good. Even going through that hardship and it gives me chills to say that, but I don't know. I mean, my life is very special and I have just such gratefulness for every single breath that I take. And it just taught me so much. 
I think you so should that, register. You know, I, 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 are you familiar with the Thornton Wilder play, Our Town? I am. I mean, you, you remind me, God, I'm going to cry. You remind me of Emily. Oh. You know? Well, so it was very interesting. So I actually, remember I said I got that device in my chest about two years before my husband died. And after about nine months, I started getting better for the first time. It was very interesting. And it was like, God just gave me this new strength. And I was able to go back to residency. I got stronger. I actually did a fellowship in hospital medicine, believe it or not, <laughs> like that's an intense schedule. And I became a hospitalist at Mayo Clinic. And then come 2015, you know, so 2008 to 2015, I pushed the limit. I, I just, I overdid it. And I started having these symptoms of nearly passing out while I was driving, while I was doing presentations, et cetera. And then in 2016, I was asked to start the integrative medicine and breast health program at the cancer center at Mayo Clinic. And it was perfect timing because I knew my heart wasn't going to be able to sustain that hospital practice uh, lifestyle anymore. So I had started that integrative medicine program. It was very successful and it was a pilot program. And I was very excited about that. And so it was September 22nd, 2022. This is a day I'll never forget. And I was scheduled to present to the Mayo Clinic leaders about the success of this program. And I was just thrilled. I mean, this is like my dream project, being able to help cancer patients live healthy lifestyles based on plant-based nutrition, exercise, mindfulness, faith, spirituality, learning how to just be still in love. I mean, oh, it's just amazing. And so as I'm walking down the stairs to go to this presentation, I was running late because I always I, I was with patients prior to that. I'd, I'd always rather be with patients than have to present to leaders about a program I know is great. But as I'm going down the stairs, my legs felt so weak and they were like quivering. It, you know, at each step that I would take, my leg would shake. And I thought, what, what on earth are you nervous? And I don't get nervous. I actually get incredibly enthusiastic about stuff. And with each step, my legs felt weaker and weaker. And I got to the bottom of the stairs and I knew I was late and I had to rush to, to get to that boardroom and I could barely open that boardroom door. And then they kind of assisted me and it was my turn to take the seat at the head of the table. And I took the seat at the head of the table. You know, everyone around the table is like super serious. And usually I would, you know, say a joke or something lighthearted to kind of make everyone feel warm and fuzzy. But today I'm like, nope, I'm going to stay on track because I think something's very wrong. And I remember taking the mouse and, you know, you control the mouse and sometimes the cursor on the screen just doesn't want to do what you're doing. And so I, I shook the mouse and it still wouldn't do it. And all of a sudden the mouse at the distant end of the screen, as I'm trying to control that cursor, that cursor got lighter and lighter and lighter. And then everyone in the room faded. And that was my last conscious memory. And I remember being in this place with no fear I would describe it as only acceptance of, of this complete unknowing. And I remember this cool air kind of blowing over my body. And, and I remember very specifically a piece of hair kind of getting stuck in my lipstick. And it was just this like gentle reminder that I was still present, but yet I wasn't really there. I, I will describe it as I felt like my entire body was enveloped in love. And it was as if, as if the hands of God were holding me. It was so beautiful. And I was having a near death experience. My heart had stopped. I had that indwelling defibrillator and it was shocking me and shocking me and shocking me, but it had no rhythm because I was actually in a flat line for four minutes. Um, so what, after, did you, what did they do? Well, they knew I had the defibrillator and that is better than, you know, they weren't going to do chest compression since my defibrillator was going on and on and on and I wasn't coming back to life. And so after about four minutes, all of a sudden there was this huge wave of energy that came through my body. And it was as if my body was just bursting with this electrifying feeling. And it was like this mystic miraculous. It's really difficult to verbalize, but all of a sudden I came back to life and a world renowned Electrophysiologist Dr. Sam Azurvatham is at Mayo Clinic Rochester reviewed my case. He's an amazing physician. And he really doesn't think the defibrillator brought me back to life because it was this very fine V fib that was essentially a flat line, almost asystole. He thinks it was really a miracle. And so, you know, that taught me not to be scared of death because it felt very beautiful. It was very warm and comforting. 
But that was the sign that my heart no longer was doing good. You know, it was no longer even able to sustain a normal, normal, normal rhythm. Wow. That must, and, I mean, for most people, that would have been scary, but not for you. <laughs> um, it was scary. No, it was scary because, you know, here I have a daughter now who doesn't have a father. And so I was scared and I was especially scared because my defibrillator really didn't work. So what are you going to do? You know, so Dr. Azure Batham did, took me to the operating room and did very sophisticated studies to try to figure out how can we put her back into that rhythm? This was crazy. Literally, they, they needed to put me back into the rhythm I went into to make sure they could get that defibrillator to work. But in doing that, they knew that there would be a chance maybe I wouldn't come back to life. I was like, are we sure we want to do this? That was the scariest procedure I ever had. I remember going under anesthesia, being terrified, just praying, 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 praying that I would come out of this procedure alive, but they had to fix my device. My device, there were many problems with it. It was causing this occlusion in my neck. Blood wasn't properly getting to the heart, coming out of the heart. It was just really complicated. i had had so many devices and instrumentation in my neck that things were just getting really, really risky. So they were able to successfully do that procedure and prove that the, the new updated defibrillator they put in my chest would be one that would hopefully get me out of a rhythm if I needed it. My symptoms continued to worsen. They even did another procedure to try to even manipulate my mitral valve a little bit to try to get that blood to go forward and not so much backwards. And in that procedure actually caused a stroke. And I lost vision. You had, in my a, left you eye. had a stroke? And I lost vision in my left eye after that. And then that's when they listed me for heart transplant. So that was in 2019. So what was it like having a stroke? And did you have any repercussions from having had that stroke? I didn't realize you had a stroke. Yeah. And it was only vision loss that I had. So I was very fortunate with that, but it, it really woke me up to the severity of what I was, of what I was going through. You know, I mean, this was now becoming very, very complex. Interestingly enough, I was working through this. Um, my work is so special to me. And so Mayo Clinic was so supportive. And so I was doing more telehealth. This was of course before COVID, but we were able to figure out this, this great platform I did more visits from home. I would still go in and see patients, but oh my gosh, I remember trying to examine patients and I would just lean against the exam table because I, I couldn't even hold myself up. Um, I would talk to patients and feel like I was going to pass out, but it was so important to me. And I remember one night after work, you know, it just took me so long to do everything. I was just so slow to think, to type, to get work done. I was walking to my car and I couldn't make it up the three steps that it takes to get to the parking garage. And I remember just crying, just thinking, gosh, I just want my life back. You know, I want to have energy. This was the first time I felt so weak and feeble and vulnerable. It was so scary just being in my own skin, even though I wasn't necessarily scared to die. It just was miserable. I just Heart failure is such a hard disease. And this is really a shout out to the need for organ donation because there's such a shortage that you have to get this sick before they'll ever consider transplantation. So in 2019 is when they finally listed me for heart transplant and they tried to keep me in the outpatient setting. And I was listed for 14 months and still no matching heart, not one call. No, man, no. so hearts have to be matched just the same way other organs do like kidneys and livers, mm -hmm. right? You can't and it's especially hard because size, and I'm a very small person. And so the size was the biggest thing, and I'm type O blood. So being type O blood is common, and I'm small. And so it just was a really hard thing. I was either going to have a, a pediatric heart, or else it would be a very small stature person that I would get the heart of. And then um, I developed COVID in November of uh, 2020. And I, I did, you know, we know the data with whole food plant-based nutrition and COVID. And, and I, I credit that to being alive. I really do. I think that my diet is why I am here today. There are no ifs, ands, and buts about it. It is why I am able to attain this vitality and really did pretty darn well during all that time with as bad as my heart was for so many years. I mean, who lives 18 years with advanced heart failure? I don't know many people that I mean, have. I, I mean, every aspect of your story is like a book or a movie. It's, I mean, you're, it's almost unbelievable other than it's true. You know what I'm saying? No, I mean, all the adversity and things you've happened. And like you said, you know, you started out as a, as a healthy person. Mm -hmm. I know. But wasn't that beautiful? Like I had like my eye on that. Like I was going to get that back. Now I knew I would one day get that back because I was listed for transplant. So January of 2021, I wasn't safe to be at home anymore. So they admitted me to the hospital for supportive therapy. I was extremely sick. 
And this was during COVID. So to be listed for heart transplant during COVID was a really difficult time because we didn't know if it was safe to take organs, if the person had COVID, and now we're giving it to a person that's going to be immunocompromised with transplant. Here, I had had COVID just weeks before, and they're going to be bottoming out my immune system when they get a transplant for me. So there was all this controversy as to what do we do? And so on February 5th, 2021, they found a matching heart. Wow. And you know, we were really limited with who could even come and see you in the hospital because it was COVID. Well, who was taking care of your daughter? Because she wasn't that old then, was she? Yeah, my mom was. I'm so supportive. My mom has helped me raise my daughter through through her whole childhood. And it's just, it's just been such a blessing. My parents are so supportive. And so my daughter had actually, she was driving at the time. She was a, a, a junior in high school or she was actually a senior in high school. She was a senior in high school at this time. So she had come to have dinner with me and I was still able to walk. I was on IV supportive therapies that were pumping my heart to be. So I walked her to the elevator and my cardiologist is like eight o'clock at night was standing at the nurse's station. I thought that's weird. I was like, someone must be getting a heart, but yet I had this kind of weird feeling, right? He's like, can I talk to you? I was like, uh-huh, but we felt so it's awkward. I remember walking down the hall with my doctor, going back to the room. It's like, neither of us said anything. It was one of those things like, do you hold your hands in front of your body? Do you hold your hands in back of your body? Do you talk? And so we make it to my room and he goes, well, I have something to share with you. And I, I knew what he was going to say. And he's like, we found a matching heart. And you would think in that moment, you would just be elated here. I've waited 18 years for this moment to get a second chance at life. Unbelievable. But I wasn't, I, I was all of a sudden like sickened, like, wait a minute, someone's dying yeah. so I can live. I, I mean, it's someone's family is losing their loved one. And now my family is going to be able to rejoice. It's just this really difficult um, concept to accept. And the next thing the doctor said, his name is Dr. Parag Patel, just an amazing human, just such a loving doctor. He said, Don, I have to share something else with you. He goes, your donor is an IV drug user and she has hepatitis C. And I thought, oh, no, it was very interesting. You know, we have to always think about our words. Our words are so strong. And there was a good friend of mine who's a psychiatrist. And a few months before my transplant, they said, Don, do you even want to have a transplant? I'm like, nope, but I need one. And why are you saying this? And they said, you know, because your personality is probably going to change. They, they do. And I'm thinking, and so when he told me that, I was thinking, oh, I am never going to take an IV drug user's heart because I don't want my personality to change. I want to stay this happy, positive Don. If I get a drug abuser heart, what if, what if I become an angry person? Like all these things are going through my mind. I don't know. And so I'm thinking, what am I going to do? And so I'm, I, I told him, I need to think about this. I don't know if I can do this. And within a few hours, I just had this knowing, like the sense of knowing came over me that Dawn, this is the right heart for you. And I had this deep purpose that this is not only the right heart for you, this is your opportunity to teach and give this heart a loving, loving life. And so I remember going down to the operating room I had eye contact with my surgeon and I had no fear. It was amazing. I'd never had any other surgery in the world without this fear. I just had gratefulness. I remember going under anesthesia and in previous surgeries, I would always pray. I would start saying the rosary. I would pray and just say, please let me wake up. And in this one, I just prayed for the donor family. I was so grateful to just be in this place and knowing that within days I would wake up be alive with the beat of a new heart. I, I didn't have any question. I knew I would wake up. And so what, there were a few complications after my surgery. They actually had to take me back to the operating room a day later and reopen me up. Oh. So I mean, did it hurt? I mean, I can't imagine it not having it being painful to have heart surgery. So it was a few days after the transplant, I woke up and I remember my entire body was like, beating against the bed. I was like, I, I almost didn't feel like I was alive. And I remember hearing this harmonious sound. I've described this before. So I know you've probably heard it, Chef AJ. And it was my hair and it was brushing against the crisp white sheets of the hospital bed. And it was in, it was in sync with the beat of my new heart. It was just this beautiful harmonious sound. And every single cell in my body was oscillating at this higher frequency. I just felt so fully alive and I have not lost that feeling. It's such a gift to treasure. And you ask about the pain. 
And what I would say is the pain was excruciating. It was agonizing pain. I do not tolerate narcotics. So I didn't use narcotics at what all. What did you do? I mean, how do I, you? I use Tylenol. I can't imagine having your chest cut open and taking a Tylenol. <laughs> it was terrible. And, and it's terrible to say that, you know, I just taking a narcotic for me makes me violently ill. And for me, nausea is worse than pain. But again, it was learning to take that pain and try to transform it and, and work your mind through it. But I remember one night in particular moaning in pain and it would hurt me. but I purposely moaned because the moan was so therapeutic. It helped me with that pain. It got better. You know, days went on. I loved the daytime. I didn't want to sleep at all. I, cause I like being awake. I'm like, Whoa, cause as soon as I go to bed, it's going to hurt. And I stayed very active. As soon as I could walk, I walked. And a few days after transplant, I had this dream and there was a time a few days after transplant that I kind of started feeling a little bit of negativity over the fact I got this donor heart. I had then acquired the hepatitis C several days after the transplant. My numbers of the virus load were in the millions. And it just was that reality that, okay, now I have hepatitis C and it needs to be treated. And this is, is this creating an inflammatory response in my body, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just hard to deal with. It's like, man, why can't I just have one break? <laughs> like, ah. The perfect marathon runner's heart or something. <laughs> I start. I don't know. I'm like, Ugh. so in this dream, it was like a sensory experience. I was in this block house and I remember running to the window. There was a single window to see if my car was there. My car wasn't there. And I turned around and there was a chair in the room. And I was wondering if my purse would be there, but my purse wasn't there. And I had no idea where I was at. And there was a door. And so I remember kind of crawling towards this door and these long blades of grass. And so I remember crawling out of this building and it was such a sensory experience. I can picture this dream to this day and the pieces of grass were grabbing onto my leg, almost as if my leg was being cut by those, those blades of grass. And I flipped over after crawling some distance in that grass and there were these big cumulus clouds going over my head. And in the distance, there were these people, families, children playing like this blissful existence. It was like heaven on earth. It was humanity with deep love and connection. It gives me chills to say this. And then within moments of that dream, a word came over me that said grace. And so I woke up in that moment and I would listen to instrumental music when I would be in the hospital. And there was a song playing at that very moment. And the title of the song was Grace. And so it's just like the serendipity, you know, and, and whenever there's these signs, you just have to trust them. And I opened up my email because I couldn't sleep. This is about two in the morning because it just was so powerful what I had just experienced. And there was an email waiting for me. And the title of that email at that very moment was full of grace. And so, you know, grace is this virtue from God. And I, I really feel that it's this power that God willingly gives us to help us do what we could never do on our own. And I just had knowing right then that this heart was, was right for me. And I named my heart Grace. So mm -hmm. that's her name. So I set out after my transplant because it was interesting in the hospital, you know, with my plant-based nutrition, when I went to the hospital, I'm like, listen, you guys need to have this stuff. <laughs> and so they did. Mayo Clinic has great whole food plant-based options on their hospital menu. And so it wasn't any problem at all for me to eat this stuff. But I had one doctor who said, you know, you need to have some muscle milk. All that soy you're having is going to cause rejection. I'm like, what? not doing muscle milk. <laughs> I will keep having my soy. So I kept having my soy and I thought, you know, I, I need to do something that's going to be remarkable. So people will understand the importance of whole food, plant-based nutrition. I'll run a marathon at one year. <laughs> people thought I was crazy, but my medical team was supportive of it. So after six weeks, my cardiothoracic surgeon said, okay, I'll let you run. So I started running after six weeks of my transplant it was incredible. And actually my time was pretty darn good. It was the craziest thing. And by three months, I ran my first 5K. At four and a half months, I climbed Camelback Mountain, that very mountain I used to climb right before I got cancer. It was just so meaningful. At eight months, one of my cardiologists ran a 10 mile race with me to see how, how I could handle it. And he pushed me super hard. I remember thinking, you're gonna kill me. He ran me so fast, but uh, at eight months, I ran that 10 mile race and I knew I, I knew I would be able to do it. So I did that half marathon, 
10 months after my transplant. And then on my one year heart transplant anniversary, I ran a full marathon. And it wasn't about running the marathon. It was really about just showing if you really take good care of your body, you, you can do anything. I mean, there is no limit. And it was fabulous. I mean, I had to really listen to my body. I really made sure I got seven to eight hours of sleep every single night. I had the perfected nutrition and I really still do. For me, perfected nutrition is my harmony. I love it. It's not as if I'm sacrificing a thing. It's just, it's the same way for you. I know too, Chef AJ, it's just my everything. It's my excitement and my enthusiasm of my day. And I trained really smart. I did physical therapy regularly to strengthen all those small muscles that had gotten so weak over, over the time, but it was amazing. I have to show, I could show this picture with you at the finish line of that marathon. There was a construction sign and on that construction sign, guess what it said? Big letters, grace. My gosh. It was crazy. And then the more crazy is my number for that marathon was 365, 365 days after the transplant. So it was really cool. Had you run marathons before? I didn't. It was different back Wait, then. So you waited till I have a heart transplant to run your first marathon. That's amazing. I, I, mean, time. I, I could have run marathons before because I was really physically fit, but it, back then it really wasn't, it wasn't as popular for people to do that. You know, I had this 18 year pause when I couldn't do anything and I was busy with medical school. So then I definitely couldn't have done a marathon, but during my undergraduate training, I just, mm -mm. I, but I would run 10, 14 miles on the weekend. So I always ran distances, but I had never run anything over uh, about 14 or 15 miles. So yeah, Jeff Galloway helped to train me. He does a run, walk, run. And so he was really pivotal with making sure I got through my training safely. And the medical team at Mayo Clinic was exceptional. They, they do a lot of runner's analysis um, in terms of their high-risk patients. And so they did this in a way that I would be safe. I would not advise a person who was not eating right not sleeping right to consider doing a marathon after transplant. And I've had a lot of transplant patients reach out to me and say, oh my gosh, I want to do this. And the first thing I say is you need to fix your diet um, because that's critical for recovery. And you don't want to put your heart in jeopardy. You don't want all those free radicals. You're already at a high risk for future cancer. So you need to be on this plant-based diet if you're going to do something like that. My recovery was crazy fast. It was so cool. What um, Elizabeth wants to know, what do you eat in a day? And did you eat differently when you were training for the marathon? Yeah. You know, it's really hard. There was one point post-transplant, I was on 75 pills a day. What? How, is anyone, how do you have time to swallow 75 pills? It is terrible. This was early on after transplant. You're on just so many pills. This was within the first few weeks. It was just really tough. And some of those transplant pills cause a lot of GI upset. And I still struggle with that tremendously. Um, and it's not something I've really been able to control. I just have to, you know, do my best and do smaller meals and so on and so forth. So I do a lot of batch cooking because I'm super busy. I always have kind of a choice of three different breakfasts. I love overnight oats and I love sprouted food. I am a big believer that our food is our energy and it helps to source our vitality. And I really believe that sprouted food is a terrific way to really enhance vital existence. And I share this with my patients. I say, you may think I'm crazy, but if we look at the traditional ancient healing systems of Ayurveda, they do talk about how sprouting, uh, sprouting food is, is very energizing for the human spirit. So I love sprouted oats. And I put a ton of berries in there, mixed berries. I do some flaxseed, usually one to two tablespoons. I may do a tablespoon or two of chia seed in with that. I do soy milk. I stir it up, let that sit overnight, and I'll have that in the morning. If I don't want that, I'll do a piece or two of Ezekiel bread with avocado, with lemon juice and garlic. I always batch prepare some roasted chickpeas. And I love my roasted chickpeas with uh, smoked paprika on it and some garlic. And I'll put some of those roasted chickpeas on the avocado toast. And then I'll put a whole bunch of microgreens on it. And I'll usually do two pieces of Ezekiel toast. And then I have this other thing that is my favorite. I had this this morning. So I'll do a piece of Ezekiel bread toasted. I'll take a bag of frozen organic raspberries with some silk and soft tofu and put the silk and soft tofu and raspberries in the food processor with some lemon juice and one or two dates. And I let that grind up. And then I put that on top of my Ezekiel bread. Oh, and I do a handful of walnuts in that, in that, uh, in that tofu. So that's my breakfast. And then for lunch, you know, especially when I'm busy, you know, a lot of times I have meetings at lunchtime. So I'll have things already batched cook. I'll do a big bowl of mixed greens. 
I will have already batch cooked some sweet potatoes. I love those purple sweet potatoes, especially those Stoke sweet potatoes. They're my favorite food. If they said, Dawn, it's your last meal, what do you want? There's two things I want. One of them is Stoke's potatoes. The other is dates with a, a pecan in it. I love dates. <laughs> So I, I, I love Stoke sweet potatoes. I think I love the color, but I love the taste. And so I'll put Stoke sweet potatoes uh, in my salad. And then I love to do quinoa with some beans in it. I put that in there. And then I usually use leftover roasted vegetables on it. And if I don't have that, I just use frozen vegetables to throw on it. And then Chef AJ has turned me on to the California balsamic dressing. And, oh, and I'll pour that on. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> I'll eat that. And then my dinner, you know, usually I do like a grilled tofu with usually a lot of grain because I want some carbohydrate for my run the next morning. And I do a ton of vegetables and I get a lot of my groceries shipped to me. And I usually go to the grocery store once or twice a week to get the fresh vegetables. And I really try to optimize my gut microbiome because I'm a big believer of gut microbiome optimization through food variety. And so I get a lot, I have a lot of fun with different, uh, you know, vegetables. So I'll just go down the vegetable aisle and things I haven't had the week before. I try to pick those things and kind of rotate it that way. So I get a lot of food diversity. Um, and I really try to work with my patients to do that too. And it, it makes it so exciting to try different food. Are you still running regularly or what do you do for exercise? Yeah, I ran eight miles this morning. Incredible. <laughs> no, it's exciting. So I'm running New York City Marathon. And that's in November, but I did have to have a recent surgery. So this has been a little tough because I had six weeks that I couldn't run. Um, after the surgery, I was so committed to, to walking to try to keep up that cardiovascular endurance. So I walked the day after surgery, a few miles. And then every weekend after that surgery, I would walk eight to nine miles. And so then I just started back running about 10 days ago. So I think I'll be okay. Um, next week's my next long run. So I love running. It takes a lot of discipline and so does whole food plant-based nutrition. And I think discipline is, is so supportive of self-love. You have to show up for yourself. I love this. A mentor taught me this. So when the heart beats blood, it keeps 5% of the blood for itself before it can serve the rest of the body. And we have to do the same in life. You've got to show up for yourself and you need to think about making time for exercise. You need to think about time about eating right and you need to sleep. And all of those things should be done in harmony. And if any of those things are in turbulence and you're doing it because you're told to do it or because you're scared of some outcome, then I don't know that that's the right reason why. So we need to deeply know our purpose too. So going back to that analogy that our heart beats 5% of the blood, uh, keeps 5% of the blood for itself before serving the rest of the body. What I love most about that is that 95% of the blood goes everywhere else. So in life, you know, I think we need to share our gifts with others. And, and that's why I'm just so blessed to be in what I do for a living, working with women with breast cancer to help them live a healthy life. And, and my job gives me back so much meaning. It's not even like work. It's a passion project. It's, I love my job. And I'm just so fortunate to be able to do that. But that's what I do for my nutrition. There was a great study at the Ohio State University I actually went to undergraduate study there, but they did this kind of cool study. And when I work with my women with whole food plant-based nutrition, I have some women come in and they're very turbulent about it. I know they don't want to do it. Their husband's making them or maybe a friend's pushing them or they're scared of dying. So that's why they want to do it. And I really want to talk to them about falling in love with the reason they want to do that whole food plant-based nutrition, that it's going to energize them. It's a way of them giving back to their body because that emotion, that conscious understanding of why you're taking part of this whole food plant-based nutrition matters. And in this study at Ohio State, they were feeding rabbits high cholesterol junk food. And there was one technician that when he would feed the rabbits, he would love the rabbits. He'd pet them and love them. And so when they did the analysis, there was this one group of rabbits that didn't have high cholesterol, but they were eating this junk food. And that's how they found out that this one technician was loving those rabbits. So, you know, I think when we eat our plant-based nutrition, we it, it generally for most people comes from a place of love and excitement and enthusiasm, but you need to have that mindset that this whole food plant-based nutrition is something that really excites you and you're doing it for all the right reasons. So I don't believe in fear tactics. You know, when I talk with patients, it's not about, oh, if you don't do this, you're going to die. Or if you don't do this, you're going to be miserable. It's like, Hey, let's do this. You're going to feel great. And gosh, look at how exciting this research is. This research is showing that it can improve cancer outcomes. This is awesome that it can enhance your chemoimmunotherapy potentially, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a beautiful position I'm in to do all this. 
I could talk forever. I don't have a problem with talking. I should probably be quiet. <laughs> well, you can come on and talk anytime because you're, you're so inspirational. Gina's wondering, how, how did your daughter do with all that happened? You know, losing her father at age five, having a mother that was <sighs> well. How, how is she doing and how did she do with this? Gina, thank you for asking that question. It was so hard on her. Bless her heart. She really struggled. And, you know, she would be comfortable with me sharing this, but she really struggled with her mood being very down. And she was very scared that I would die. And within the last year, she has flourished. Like she has this knowing, and you know what she said? She goes, mom, I was scared until you were a year out from your transplant because I knew that was the most likely time you would die. She's like, it wouldn't be that you would die going into the transplant, but you would die within that first year. And she said, now I know you're safe. And it was just like this burden was lifted off her. She's doing so amazing in school. She's actually coming home from Auburn University to see me uh, today, this afternoon. So I'm so excited to see her. And she, when she went to college, though, she fell off the whole food plant-based bandwagon. <laughs> oh, I was going to ask you, was she raised whole food plant-based? She was raised very healthy, but, you know, she, her dad was not whole food plant-based. And so she kind of, you know, was in the middle. So I, I never, I, I, I had her eat extremely healthy and it was always whole food, but she did have some chicken and things like that. But it, that's not necessarily what I encourage. And when she went to college at first year, she definitely fell away from it and she didn't feel good. You know, she had gained weight, her skin wasn't as clear. So now she's on whole food plant-based and her friends are like, oh, I'm like, you're back. I'm so happy. So we're going to go have a nice whole food plant-based dinner tonight. So she's very excited about it and shares certain recipes that she's making herself at college. She goes to a school in Alabama and it's very difficult to eat healthy there when those kids go out. So I'm hoping that she um, takes some interest even in, in uh, lifestyle medicine. Through the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, they have so many opportunities for undergraduate students to go onto that campus and be influential with the importance of healthy living, especially that uh, with whole food plant-based nutrition. So I'm trying to encourage her to take part in that. Wow. Mick, can I ask, did you ever remarry? So I did, and I met an amazing man, and he was so, so supportive for Sophia during this entire time, and we have just been very fortunate to um, have that friendship, and we kind of lived two very different lives, though. You know, during this time, it's it's difficult when you go through these, um, these struggles together, you know, and then one person kind of comes out of it, this new transformed person. And he never knew me really this way, right? This high energy, incredibly vital. Though I was like that before, but now I'm really like with such deep purpose and passion. And so we're working on things. We 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 are actually honestly we're struggling a little bit um, because I have this new normal life that is what Dawn was always about, and it's like, oh my gosh, my life is on. And and he's not a whole food plant based, which is really hard and it's really difficult because I just. When you're so passionate about it, you just want your loved ones to all be healthy and, and nurture their life in the same way. So, so we're working on it. It's it's hard. It's very difficult. I anybody not adore you though? You're just. I mean, I, I I can't imagine the first date. I mean, like just telling. I mean, just telling this story. It's just. It's quite. It's quite a story. And like I said, if if it didn't happen to you, I, I would say that's that's not possible for all these things to happen to somebody. Like, oh, you're yeah. very kind, Chef AJ. Thank you. But I have my weaknesses too, and I'm working on those and we're, we're trying to work on that. But that's my biggest struggle right now in my life. And I'm very open with my life. And, you know, you just have to be authentic to yourself. And we both do. And, and I believe in that. And for me, my priority in life right now is really to help serve others. I just have such a desire and need and I'm alive because of a gift from another human being. What a sacrifice, right? to be able to transform the finality of death into deep meaning and purpose. And, and I want to make sure that I do that with my life to help others. And for example, yesterday I had this beautiful breast cancer retreat for my patients all day long where women got to learn about the importance of whole food plant-based nutrition and the importance of movement and love and social connections. We had a beautiful whole food plant-based lunch for my patients. And so it's really exciting. Mayo Clinic has been very supportive of what I um, envision for, for our patients. And I'm, I'm blessed to do that. I'm also part of Blue Zones Jacksonville. And so I'm really excited to be able to work in more of these underserved populations to help to inspire people. 
give them resources to help them live a meaningful life and one that is in line with health and wellness because it should be an easy choice for everyone. There should never be obstacles. So that is like, it gives me chills to say that. I get chills and goosebumps all the time. It's so cool. I live with goosebumps because everything's so exciting to me. But the Blue Zones project is something very special. And I'm really, really looking forward to that. So I just get so much deep meaning and love from what I do in my career and to be able to see these women and hear these stories yesterday of some of these women that are on their plant-based diets. One woman, she's been on her whole food plant-based diet now after her breast cancer diagnosis for uh, since April. And she's lost 30 pounds. Her A1C is now almost normal. It's like 5.8. She was previously diabetic. And she said her heartburn is gone. And she said she feels 20 years younger. And she's from the deep South. And she said, I never thought I'd be eating oatmeal and berries for breakfast. And she's actually on my Instagram and she has this big smile. I, I had seen her a few weeks back and in, 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 as a patient. And then she was at the retreat yesterday. So I said, you have to share your story. I had another woman there that she's lost 35 pounds. Another one who's lost 60 pounds, all from whole food plant, only no oil. You know, the no oil is the trick for postmenopausal weight management. And I see so many patients and, you know, patients are so vulnerable. They listen to all these different media venues pushing stuff out there. And so many women pour olive oil on everything they do. And I, I'm not necessarily here to villainize olive oil. That's not my, my reason for saying this, but it's just too many calories. So get rid of it. You don't yeah, need it. Absolutely. You don't need it. Before I forget, and can people see you in person or, or do you only do virtual appointments? I only do virtual appointments and it works out the best that way. My visits are actually 90 minutes. I don't think there's another doctor in the country that does that the, the, the system would support that, but Mayo Clinic supports my new consultations is 90 minutes. And I generally only see breast cancer patients. I do make exceptions for certain cancers, but my practice is pretty full. And Mayo Clinic accepts, accepts all commercial insurances. So if someone's interested, they could call Mayo Clinic in Florida, but I see patients from around the world. And it's just been so, so enriching. That, before I forget, because somebody knew you were going to be on the show, they had a breast question. They asked to be anonymous, but maybe you can answer this as a doctor. And uh, the question asker asks a doctor, um, you Salem, what could be the cause of random breast nipple sensitivity for what looked like a blood blister formed and eventually leaked? No blister now, just sensitivity. Mm -hmm. I would hope that this person did have an examination, you know, regardless of age, even if this person is 28, 35, under the age of 40 or beyond, you need to likely have imaging for that just to make sure everything is okay. When it comes to the nipple, there can be diseases of the nipple that occur that we want to know about. So, you know, generally if someone's under the age of 30, it's just going to be a simple ultrasound. If you're over the age of 30, it's going to be an ultrasound and a mammogram, but I would definitely have someone investigate that. It sounds terrific that it's that it's gone. I will share a funny story. It's an anonymous person. So I could share this. The number one reason that I would see women coming in and having nipple issues sometimes was just from um, sexual activity. You know, so if that, that is one question I would always ask, even though it makes people feel a little uncomfortable when you ask it. And I'll never forget because there was a woman and she was in her mid seventies and she came in and she had a nipple issue. And I thought, do I ask that? And I asked her that. And she goes, that is what it is. She's like, he loves to play with my nipples. <laughs> And so I said, tell him to stop at least until this heals up. And I'm going to see you back. Oh my gosh. Week. And she was like, he's not going to like you. I was like, well, we need to get this healed up because I think this is what the cause is. And sure enough, that's what it was. And she was so stinking cute. But listen, I said, that is healthy. You know, intimacy and sexuality is so good for relationships. So I just thought that was awesome. So it's a cute story. But please have that checked out. That's very important. Right. Here's a question from a live viewer. Michelle, how can a Mayo cancer patient in Rochester, Minnesota experience this path with their providers? Absolutely. So we do have the Integrative Medicine and Health Program, um, though the Integrative Medicine and Health Program isn't necessarily lifestyle medicine. So I am at this time one of a few other lifestyle medicine doctors at Mayo Clinic. I am the only one where my practice is full-time lifestyle medicine. If you are a cancer patient at Mayo Clinic, I do see patients from all three sites. So you could ask your oncologist to order a visit specifically with me. They can message me in the portal on your chart and we can get that set up for you. Um, 
There is an amazing nutritionist at Mayo Clinic of Rochester, uh, Joseph Gonzalez. He has worked with Neil Barnard. He's worked with uh, many, uh, Dr. Michael Greger. He used to write for Nutrition Facts. And so Joseph is right there in Rochester. And so they could also put a nutrition consult and they could put Joseph specifically for whole food plant-based nutrition guidance. And Joseph's helping me see some of my patients regardless of what site they're at as well. Um, but yes, my goal is to grow this program. In fact, I'm director for the Lifestyle Medicine Residency Curriculum. I have over 40 residents from across the enterprise at Mayo Clinic. We're getting ready to enroll our next group of residents on top of those 40. So we may have 60 residents. It's very fascinating to see the interest among our residents. And these are some of the sharpest, smartest minds in the world. So I'm really excited. See, I got goosebumps again. Excited to have this opportunity to work with these young minds and their enthusiasm to help them become lifestyle medicine doctors as well. The board certification through the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is a very um, important pathway for doctors to take if they want to be a part of this sort of medicine so they can properly onboard people with whole food plant-based nutrition. Because if I have a person that's willing to do it, I want them to be the healthiest person on this planet. I don't want them to be someone who ends up with, you know, any deficiencies because they're not doing things properly. But let's face it, on the standard American diet, that's more risky, right? But I want my uh, whole food plant-based patients to shine perfectly. Wow. You just, I mean, what a great way to spend a Sunday talking to you. Like, is that we don't have to go to church now. So <laughs> Well, obviously people can follow you on Instagram. The link is in the show notes, which is below the uh, description, you know, on YouTube. That's it's best guys to watch on YouTube. You can see all the links. If they want to make an appointment, they can make an appointment. We have to wait for the book and the movie, apparently, because it's not written yet, even though I've already cast it with Margot Robbie. But, uh, you know, what can I tell you? Oh you're, gosh. You're just, I mean, you're just, you know, talk about a lot, having purpose in life, you know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I hope that, that everything going forward is, is going to be easy and joyful for you. You know, you've been through so much and you've just risen to the top. Do you have any lasting effects from anything? Like, cause somebody had asked, cause you said when you had the stroke, you lost vision, like that came back. Mm -hmm. Fortunately it did. I still out of my peripheral vision in my left eye, I don't have that visual field. It is gone, but I don't pay attention to it in terms of residual side effects. Um, I don't know. Maybe I do. I just don't have time for it. You know, I just dismiss it. Uh, you know, there's some discomfort in the sternal wound where I had that open heart surgery. There's these big wires that you can actually see. It's kind of ugly. Um, that hurts. If I lean over, I notice that, but gosh, I will say that the plant-based diet keeps the inflammation so low. I think that's why I feel really, really good. The only side effect that that's a tough one is the GI side effects, especially with running. And it's just been hard to, to, to figure that out. And you know, you just do your best. You just accept it. I'm alive. I'm so grateful. And, and that's what it's all about. And now I'm down to very few pills, by the way. I don't have to. You need them. to have like a regular presence. Cause just, I mean, just listening to you just is so inspiring, you know, cause I tend to like, you know, uh, make mountains out of molehills and then really, you know, I like, I have a little pain in my hip and then I listen to your story and it's like, you know what? It's just, it's just, you're just helping so many people just, just sharing your story. Even, even if you weren't a doctor helping people that way. So um, people love your energy. It's an, and they think you're amazing. And um, they've been mentioning in the chat that you're going to be speaking at a T. Colin Campbell retreat in October. So if they wanted to meet you in person, they could come there. I am. I'm just so excited about that opportunity. And it was really such an honor to be invited to be on uh, nutrition studies with T. Colin Campbell's uh, medical advisory board. So I love the ability to do that. And they've done such wonderful work to help um, inform doctors through their training. I really feel that for any doctor who wants to learn how to prescribe whole food plant-based nutrition, it's wonderful to become board certified, but you really need to do the T. Colin Campbell training and, and attain that certificate. And even for people who want to learn more about whole food plant-based nutrition, that is a wonderful course. It is very science forward though. So it's not an easy course and it's very time consuming. So I want to give them a huge shout out and applaud them. And yes, I will be at the retreat. I'm very excited to be um, honored to speak at that. I'd tell you to keep the faith, but you already are. Well, AJ, you are so inspiring and you have no idea the power that you have on people yourself. So just know that. And I feel so joyful and like energized being with you this morning. So thank you. Way to start the day. And you're getting two more bottles of vinegar. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Well, Dr. Dawn, thank you so much. What a, what a, what a, what a, what a gift you are.
Thank you, Chef AJ. Thank and everybody's you. saying, please have you back. So I know we, we were going to share some pictures. We didn't have time for that. So come back and, and maybe share some of those photos next time. That sounds great, Chef AJ. Thank you for everything. Have a great Thank day. you so much. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time. My guest is Shane Martin from Shane and Simple. And he's going to tell you how plant-based saved his life and be going to be making a recipe, chickpea curry in a hurry. Thanks, everyone. Please share this broadcast because it is so worthwhile. Take care.